deployed drones in the pandemic and we all thought, God, they're so dystopian. Well, now they're doing it in New York and you're paying for it. <laughs> Hello there, you 6.5 million Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining us on our mutual voyage to truth and freedom that we undertake together. Hit that notification bell right now. Don't hit it, just touch it lightly. It doesn't help us that you use force. And subscribe to our channel. All of this benefits us hugely. We have got to do something together in order to make this a better world by personally awaking. Otherwise, these dystopic forces, these elite establishment cartels that are gathering around us like a technocratic storm will deluge us in their dreadful power. The NYPD are now using drones to spy on you on Labor Day. Obviously for your security and safety. I don't know like how that could help. Oh no, they dropped a hot dog. <laughs> Quick, get that out of the grill. It could be safe. I quite like the burned ones. What's it going to do that's going to benefit anyone up there? Hey, if you want to come and see me in a few intimate shows this month in September, there are a handful of tickets available. There's a link in the description below. Come and see me. Let's get into this story. Do you want to pay for this police state that's being normalized, digi dogs, drones, surveillance, taking your digital data, using your biometrics, it's being normalized around you. The rate of change is extraordinary. I remember when I saw one of those drones in China, I was like, no man, no, this ain't right, baby. No, this is Paul Verhoeven shit. I'm not standing for this Robocop crap. And I was just like, you know, you just sit in your garden eating Cheetos while drones tell you what to do. You've got too much cheese dust on your finger. Sorry, drone. Don't lick that like that, you pervert. Actually, I was eating them with the other hand. Let's have a look at how the mainstream media are bringing you news of the arrival of this Huxleyan nightmare. People will also be attending outdoor parties and big parades over this last weekend of the summer season. And the NYPD will be watching out for trouble in a whole new way using surveillance drones meant to respond faster than officers. Faster. That's what they're meant to do. They're meant to respond faster. I bet there have been news stories for a while in New York. I'm not there, but are they like going, NYPD response times are getting longer. They've prepped you with that, right? That's what they do in our country. For ages, you can't get the police to come if there's a burglary, that kind of thing. And then they'll go, how about if a drone comes? Oh God, all right, just send something then. Send Robocop, send R2D2, just send somebody for this burglary. CBS News' Elijah Westbrook joins us live here in the studio with more on this, Elijah. That's right, well, you know, Chris and Mary, essentially when you look at it, these drones are the eyes and ears from the skies. Which is disgusting. Who wants eyes and ears from the sky? I mean, in the Bible, when it's like locusts and frogs, it's pretty disturbing. Don't ears and snout. We're gonna sniff you from the sky to make sure Sure you're washing your butt properly. What do you mean properly? I don't know. Give me a sniff. Not bad. Not bad. Have another hot dog. Don't put it there. Hovering over parties and large festivities aimed at keeping people safe, of course. Oh, okay. Aimed at keeping people safe, of course. It's always like he remembered while doing it that this is meant to be propaganda for the state. This is all the news is. It preps you and grooms you and normalizes increasing authoritarianism and eases the new measures into your consciousness in a way that stops you rejecting them like a stranger's kidney from the sky. Now, police say, for example, they get a 311 complaint about loud music at a house party. The idea is to to deploy the drone and pre-screen what is happening at that location. Pre-screen, it's only a preparatory measure. It's only a couple of weeks to flatten the curve and to stop the spread. What I would say is if you're a member of the police force is them drones are coming for your job next. That'll be the next thing. Entirely automated police forces of digi dogs and drones. And then the last hope we have that the police force and the military are made up of men and women just like us from the same communities that we came from. And that when it comes to the day when they go, we don't need them anymore. We've got AI everything. Kill them. They might go, oh, that's my cousin. That's my auntie. That will be gone. Yes, DigiDog will comply. DigiDog will obey. <laughs> Now, the drones are said to be equipped with audio devices and speakers that are operated by officers on the ground. Audio devices and speakers, they're going to hover above your Labor Day party. I hope you enjoyed Labor Day, by the way, or whatever it is next. Halloween, whatever. Some peaceful protest, not peaceful enough. Some other activity. This is where they normalize it, where they introduce you to it slowly, slowly, easing it in. Like the media equivalent of Saucy How's Your Father. Hmm. What the fuck is Saucy How's Your Father? Look it up. Watch a carry on film. 
Those officers are also able to play a live or pre-recorded message and ask for compliance with, let's say, turning down the music before cops arrive. Now, the NYPD says this tactic was used in June during the city's Pride Parade. That hat is too elaborate and dangerous, but it's Pride. Not that much Pride. Where hundreds of people gathered inside Washington Square Park. They say within 10 minutes, the park was cleared without having to send out additional officers into the crowd. We've been trying to be obedient, not only to abstract authority or the messaging of the media, but now in the streets, the agents of authority can now just fly above your garden or your yard and tell you what to do. I say that we have to have a type of obedience to a higher cause, a higher principle, but being obedient to this kind of authoritarianism will be our downfall. And here's something that's interesting. Police also tell us there's warnings being sent out to gang members to be on their best behavior. Look at the extraordinary scope of NYPD policing methods. Very, very high-tech, dystopic, Orwellian surveillance drones in your yard, booming down on you that you're overcooking your buns, to the most antiquated, extraordinary, age of innocence style inscriptions. Cops have sent letters to the homes of about 40 people who are on record as a known gang member from the area. Dear gang members, I hope all is well with you. The weather here is fine. Hope all is well with your gangs and your numerous homies. May we ask you to party sensibly during the holiday and riot season. Yours sincerely, NYPD. I think there's a mail strike on. Ah, drop it off by drone. We're told the letter informs them they have been identified and will face scrutiny. You know what these gang members fear above all else? Being murdered like so many of their friends? No. Scrutiny. Nobody likes to be scrutinized. Ah, the scrutiny, the scrutiny. <laughs> when this happened in China a couple of years ago, when we were all being introduced to the idea of centralised authoritarianism being induced and monitored by surveillance methods, I thought this looked terrifying. I remember like watching this in something akin to awe. Oh my God, we gathered around our screens. Look at this, they're just like, drones shouting at Chinese folks, telling them to stay in their house. Now, it's happening in like New York, where Midnight Cowboy, Scorsese, Jay-Z, drones. What we're inviting you to consider, and let me know how you feel about this in the comments, is the rate of change. That something that was extraordinary in China two years ago is normal in New York City. Can you please use that to create an equation in your own head for what the rate of progress going forward might be? Of course they're not going to just go, oh, there's digi dogs outside your house or telling you what to do. First they'll be, the digi dogs are helping out at a soup kitchen over Christmas. The digi dogs turned up at this parade. They had their own float. And then it's like, oh, we've for some reason or another, climate, pandemic, whatever it is this time, you've all got to stay in your homes, do listen to the DigiDog. There's a DigiDog coming around to give you an injection or tax you or whatever it'll be. Mark my words, I've said it on video now, check the date, let us know in the comments if you agree. Let's scrutinise this story as if it were a gang member and put the fear of God into it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Customs and Border Protection, CBP, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, have refined their surveillance operations by including detection of sentiment and emotion by using AI-powered software. Sentiment and emotion, like sort of inner states, the archetypal inner organs of your life are being evaluated by government agencies now. To what end? Well, to help you, of course, and to keep you safe, I assume. Those targeted by the software targeted are travellers either arriving to or leaving the US who are considered a potential threat to a fairly wide range of interests, public and national security, trade and travel. They're introducing it with a community that they don't imagine will have much support. Migrants, whether you're pro or anti-migrants, whether you're concerned about migration or not, let me know in the comments. Surely you will agree that this is a community that will be an easy way to pilot this idea. This is just people that are coming into our country, we've got to monitor their sentiments and facial expressions. You think that that's going to be the end of it? Have you ever experienced Experienced anything lately where it was introduced for a short time and then prolonged, whether it's the Patriot Act or measures around the pandemic? Do you really believe that your government and its corporate partners have the discipline and goodwill to use this stuff judiciously? Do you have that kind of trust? Let me know in the comments. And these persons of interest, that sounds so innocuous, you're a person of interest. We're going to scrutinize you. Mm -hmm. Strange facial expression, rejecting scrutiny. I don't like being scrutinized. Hmm, why is that? Scrutinize further, scrutinize further. Person of interest. 
A person of interest can be foreign and US citizens alike. <laughs> Imagine a Venn diagram like Kamala Harris. Okay, so it could be foreign people, that's these people, and American people, that's these people. So you mean everyone? Well, I suppose you are either American or not American. Yeah, that's everyone. Even aliens that includes, and the digi dogs themselves. In what other ways are American state agencies that you fund competing with Chinese dystopic measures? Let's find out. The FBI have amassed 20 21.7 million DNA profiles equivalent to about 7% of the US population, according to bureau data reviewed by The Intercept. The FBI aims to nearly double its current 56.7 million budget for dealing with its DNA catalogue with an additional $53.1 million, according to its budget request for fiscal year 2024. The requested resources will allow the FBI to process the rapidly increasing number of DNA samples collected by the US Department of Homeland Security, the appeal for an increase says. In an April 2023 statement, submitted to Congress to explain the budget request, FBI Director Christopher Wray cited several factors that had significantly expanded the DNA processing requirements of the FBI. He said the FBI collected around 90,000 samples a month, over 10 times the historical sample volume, and expected that number to swell to about 120,000 a month, totaling about 1.5 million new DNA samples a year. The FBI declined to comment on this. There are several presidential candidates that are saying that the FBI should be disbanded. We know that FBI whistleblowers have said that the January six investigation, for example, was handled badly. How much do you trust deep state agencies like the FBI and CIA with your genetic information? Can you envisage a situation where they had total access to your data and then maybe the ability to shut down your bank accounts and the ability to fly drones over your house? Oh, you're paranoid, you're paranoid. No, I'm not. I'm just looking at this information and offering a prognosis before it's too late. What's not paranoid then? Oh, let's just wait and see what they're doing. Oh yeah. But is it paranoid to imagine that wars might have a motivation other than humanitarian motivation when all other wars in the past, since the Second World War, let's say, have had precisely that motivation. Is it paranoid to imagine that this technology might end up being used to control the population when what's being offered is security and service? Is that paranoid? Am I paranoid? Let me know. Let me know. Who wants to be surveilled and scrutinised by an unloving state? We're all self-conscious about our appearance. I love you exactly as you are. You don't need to change anything. But if you are self-conscious about hair loss, you might consider these little babies millions of Americans, men and women, are worried about their hair thinning. Maybe hair thinning runs in the old family. Is your pappy as bald as a coot? This stuff! It delivers on its promise without the harsh side effects, unwanted chemicals, and unplinted stink hole of other products. Thanks to our friends that develop GenuCell skincare, Provia uses a safe, natural ingredient, Procopol, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and loss. And it tastes delicious. You don't drink it, I'm mucking around. Effective for men and women of any age. And it's safe on coloured, treated, and styled hair. New customers save over 50% off Provia's introductory pack Package at proviahair.com forward slash brand. That's proviahair.com forward slash brand. Provia works, baby. That's guaranteed or 100% of your money back. What you got to lose? Only your stinking hair. Now, what the hell's going on with these surveillance drones? The taking of your genetics, which is probably making you bald as a coot in the first place, and the bloody FBI. Let's get into it, guys. The staggering increases are raising questions among civil liberties advocates. When we're talking about rapid expansion like this, it's getting us ever closer to a universal DNA database. Nice ring to it. Vera Eidelman, a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union who specializes in genetic privacy. God, that's a thing now. Told The Intercept. The FBI began building a DNA DNA database as early as 1990. By 1998, it helped create a national database called Combined DNA Index Systems, or CODIS, that spanned all 50 states. Each state maintained its own database with police or other authorities submitting samples based on their state's rules, and CODIS allowed all the states to search across the entire country. At first, the collection of data was limited to DNA from people convicted of crimes, from crime scenes, and from unidentified remains. Why don't you consult Edward Snowden for a few seconds and see if he thinks this could be be misused down the line. Let Edward Snowden tell you how government agencies have historically used this type of information and whether or not you want to give those same agencies increased powers of surveillance, observation and control. Even those categories were controversial at the time. When CODIS was launched nationally, most states did not submit DNA from all people convicted of felonies. The only point of consensus among the state's collection program was to take DNA from convicted sex offenders. That's how it starts. You start with something that seems 
perfectly reasonable. Well, wouldn't it be good to monitor sex offenders and to know where they're moving and what they're going to be doing? Yes. Yeah, I would like to know that. God, I've got kids. Jesus, yes, of course, of course. I'm concerned about people. Right. What about... And then... Everyone! If you look back when CODIS was established, it was original for violent or sexual offenders. Anna Lewis, a Harvard researcher who specialises in the ethical implications of genetic research, told The Intercept, The ACLU warned that this was going to be a slippery slope. And that's indeed what we've seen. Today, police have the authority to take DNA samples from anyone sentenced for a felony charge. In 28 states, police can take DNA samples from suspects arrested for felonies, but who have not been convicted of any crime. Not been convicted of any crime. Now, we've gone from sex offenders to not convicted of any crime. Oh. In some cases, police offer plea deals to reduce felony charges to misdemeanor offences in exchange for DNA samples. How fantastic. Oh, felony charge, that doesn't look good. That carries a mandatory 5 to 10. Oh, well, I'm innocent, but God, the judiciary is so crazy. What if we were to change it to a misdemeanor? Oh, I suppose so. Is there anything you need from me? Yeah. I need you just to look out the window for a moment. That'll be all for now. Could I at least get a cuddle? No cuddles. It changed massively, Lewis said, of the rules and regulations around government DNA collection. You only have to be a person of interest to end up in these databases. That's anyone. Anyone can become a person of interest. You could be like, oh, you're unvaccinated. Oh, you have this religion. Oh, you have this cultural identity. You attended this march. You supported this campaign. We had to investigate your bank account. That's why I think we're creating a climate of cynicism and suspicion and doubt and oppositionism and guilt and shame. No one's per- Perfect. Everyone's got flaws. Everyone's made mistakes. You know, the whole culture is gearing towards a kind of mentality of condemnation, a removal of ambiguity and nuance in favour of centralised authoritarianism. Unless there is the possibility for redemption, unless there is the possibility for conversation, unless there is the possibility for true consensus, government by consensus, that's what democracy ultimately means, isn't it? Well, if we want something, we'll vote for it and then you'll do it. Unless we get that, unless we return to that fast, we're all criminals. The database is likely to continue proliferating as DNA technology becomes more sophisticated, Lewis explained, pointing to the advent of environmental DNA which allows for DNA to be collected from ambient settings like wastewater or air. Oh my god, so someone might follow you into the toilet. Hey, I'd leave that a minute if I was you. No, thank you. I'll get everything I need. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's all going in the database. And I'll have that air as well. Hey, you're meant to be standing eight feet away. We just made that up. Just by breathing, you're discarding DNA in a way that can be traced back to you, Lewis said. Oh, good. So all we have to do to avoid being on a database is stop breathing. Good night. While this might sound like science fiction, the federal government has already embraced the technology. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely, sweet authority. In May, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which I didn't even know existed, offered a contract for laboratory services to assist with autonomously collected eDNA testing, environmental DNA testing based on samples that are no longer even manually collected. Amazing. Stop cooking those hot dogs. Stop making that noise. And also, we'll have some of that DNA, you bastards. Meanwhile, we would like to invite the Crips and Bloods to join us for a soiree. Until recently, the US DNA database surpassed even that of authoritarian China, which launched an ambitious DNA collection program in 2017. That year, the BBC reported the US had about 4% of its population's DNA, while China had about 3%. Worse than China. Worse than China. 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 Since then, China announced the plan aimed at collecting between 5 and 10% of its male population's DNA, according to a 2020 study cited by the New York Times. You start to see what the role of fear is in all of this. If you're continually anxious and fearful, and let me know in the comments if you are, you're much more inclined to accommodate measures that are intrusive. Do you want males committing crimes? Are you worried about your children? Yes. Are you worried generally? There's more crime happening, isn't there? Do you feel a bit more afraid in the environment? There's a lot of things to worry about. We're going to need to take these measures. In order to legitimise authority, you have to generate fear. Do you see how that's what's happening? If you feel sort of robust, happy, healthy, connected to a community, connected to yourself, connected to nature, you're less inclined to be sort of reaching out for some mummy daddy authoritarian state that claims it's going to look after you when ultimately it's looking after itself and its corporate partners. Let me know in the comments if you agree. China has a record of abusing its DNA database for surveillance and crackdowns on dissent. And there we are. We've arrived at the destination. We start with safety and security and helping you and police officers arriving more quickly on the scene and pre-screening. I want to ask you, sir, are you worried about sex criminals? My God, yeah. Jesus, we're all worried about sex criminals. Exactly. 
Exactly. And then where do we end up? Dissent. We're all criminalized. We're criminalized by virtue of our individual freedom. Your liberty is being classified as a crime. All they have to do to justify authoritarianism is create the conditions where authoritarianism is the only option. We have to have authority because of uh, war, because of uh, climate change, because of a uh, pandemic, because of uh, everyone. If you are unafraid, if you are individually awake and willing to take responsibility for your own life and the life of your community, if there's something in your life that means more to you than your ability to accrue commodities and engage commercially, then you are a problem. The efforts have been aided by American technology and expertise. Oh, that's interesting. China, who are being framed as an enemy geopolitically when it comes to semiconductors and Taiwan, are allies here. I wonder if America and China have been collaborating in other ways in recent years, in other experiments that involve DNA and technology. Let me know in the comments if you've heard anything like that. I mean, I don't know. Whereas DNA analysis once had to be conducted in a lab by a cumbersome manual process of manually matching DNA strands that took months, the process has since been fully automated. Under rapid DNA analysis, a DNA profile can be developed in one to two hours after a simple swab of one's inner cheek without a lab or human involvement. It's not like in the last couple of years we've all been swabbing ourselves in the nose or inner cheek and having that conduct normalised and sending it away. Oh shit. When surveillance technology gets cheaper, easier and faster to use, said Edelman of the ACLU, it tends to get used more, often in ways that are troubling. We're continually sold that technological advances will benefit us and certainly I love my technological devices. I love being able to communicate with you right now. It means the world to me. But we have to be aware that this technology usually benefits the most powerful institutions the most, whether that's corporate or state institutions. They're the ones that are going to be able to fast track this technology. They're the ones with an agenda to assert control and to create the conditions that require control, they're the ones that are pushing for this stuff. I am not a Luddite, nor am I a Rousseauian worshipper of the nobility of savagery. But I do believe that we have to remain connected to nature and we have to be mindful about the way that technology is used. Quite simply, technology is a tool, like language is a tool, and we have to use these tools for our mutual benefit, for our individual awakening, for the advancement of our kind, for the love of God. And in a godless society, where do we go? Well, I'll tell you where we go. To prison, because you're guilty of breathing. In 2021, the FBI touted as a major milestone the contribution of its 20 millionth DNA profile to the National DNA Database, calling it one of the most successful investigative tools available to US law enforcement. Unbelievable. It's a milestone, all right? And uh, there are a few more miles to cover, but I mean, who's going to prevent them from covering those miles? Unless the FBI does get disbanded. Let me know in the comments what you think. While DNA has played an important role in prosecuting crimes, less than 3% of the profiles have assisted in cases the Bureau's data reveals. By comparison, fingerprints collected by the FBI from current and former federal employees link them to crimes at a rate of 12% each year, the Bureau testified in 2004, when fingerprint technology was far less sophisticated. So the, statistically, this research is not as effective as fingerprinting. For civil liberties advocates, a government database of everyone's DNA would be rife for abuses. A universal database really just would subvert our ideas of autonomy and freedom and the presumption of innocence. Do you feel that happening everywhere? That it really now is guilty until proven innocent? That all of us are guilty in some way of saying the wrong thing, of thinking the wrong thoughts, of breathing in the wrong place, of leaving our dirty water accessible to analysis? Once this technology exists, they won't be able to resist using it. It would be saying that it makes sense for the government to track us at any time based on our private information, Eidelman told The Intercept. Adding that DNA collection presents specific risks to privacy. So there you are, a package of stories that indicate that what was regarded as impossible and dystopic just a couple of years ago and what could be seen as a miracle of human advancement are becoming tools of authoritarianism. That your DNA, your time in your garden, your facial expressions, all could be used to create profiles of you and the gradient from clear criminality to person of interest has already been traversed. Your freedom is being criminalized. Your liberty is a cause for their concern. We have to learn to be disobedient. We have to learn to not comply. We have to learn to form new alliances with one another that transcend their tendency to separate us and turn us against one another because they have the tools for dystopia now. They're creating the legislation. As far as I know, they're building the gulags and the jails. We have to resist together.
together. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments below? If you enjoyed this video, have a look at either of these. Remember, if you're in the UK, I'm doing a handful of small, intimate shows. You can come. There's a link in the description if you want to come and see me do that stuff. More important than any of that, though, is that you please, if you can, stay free. Okay, yeah, yeah, give me the one that doesn't work, yeah. This, this past week on Morning Joe, I saw a snippet of you asking Reverend Al Sharpton why you should vote for him over John Kerry or John Edwards when you were in college. Yes. Okay, Give me his charge. 18 years old. Okay. I was a freshman in Harvard and I considered okay. voting for All right. someone who wasn't a Republican because right. I hated George Bush. Uh, I I, okay, yeah. that's that. When I was in college, my first vote was for Ronald Reagan. Excellent. And as a lifetime conservative, yeah. I want to know how you can assure me you're not just another rhino sure. who's going to turn your back on us. And it's a good stomp question. Stomp on the conservative movement. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just fess up on something. I did not come out of the birth canal spouting conservative talking points. <laughs> didn't. That wasn't me. I've been uh, they, they don't like me saying it that way. That's like, don't say things like that. <laughs> so 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 this is the truth. I came to my views because of my experiences. So when I was 18 years old. I was badly disaffected. I ended up voting libertarian in that election. I couldn't have cared for George Bush. I couldn't have cared for John Kerry. So I knew it was a throwaway vote. It wasn't going to change the outcome of the election, but at least there was a guy who at least was less painful as a politician. I had a throwaway vote there, and then I'll just fess up further to you. McCain versus Obama sat it out. Romney versus Obama sat it out. I was disaffected, and I get why young people are disaffected from politics, because everything I told you from weapons of mass destruction to the 08 bailouts, that falls at the feet of Republicans. Everything that Obama sold us as a false bill of goods, that fell at the feet of the Democrats. And so I was jaded and cynical for a long time. What drew me in, it wasn't even back to partisan politics, I didn't think, but in 2020, so first of all, my first son was born. There's something about that that changes your perspective. And looking back, that probably was the more important part of what happened in 2020. But a few months later, I'm a CEO of a biotech company, minding my own business. We develop five medicines that are FDA approved today. One of them is a life-saving therapy in kids. Another one for prostate cancer. This was my world. Okay, just a very different world than I'm in right now. And then George Floyd dies. And then there's a demand that I make a statement and or a donation on behalf of Black Lives Matter. That didn't make sense to me. And even then, I keep an open mind. You know, look up your organization. I don't you know, really think this is the company's place, but let's see what's going on here. On the front page of the website, it says, we call for dismantling the nuclear family structure. Hmm. See, I, have open mind. I did have the ultimate privilege of two parents in the house with a focus on education and a belief in God. So I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be supporting some organization that calls for dismantling the nuclear family structure. That led to a series of controversies. This is a multi-billion dollar biotech company. I, you know, some of the yeah. most prominent investors in the world are buying me in this, in this adventure. I'm in my 30s. High profiles. I ended up making a decision. Six months later, multiple advisors to my company resign when I write an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal with a former law professor of mine arguing that tech companies cannot do the government's bidding when they're censoring speech through the back door that government pressures them to do. That's a familiar argument now. As the first person to make that argument, multiple advisors to my company resigned within 72 hours of writing that. So I had to face a choice. Right? The easy thing to do is you just recite chapter and verse. It's a pretty good seat for me to be in. The CEO of a big company is a young guy. I could do that and do what's actually going to keep my company out of trouble, or I could speak my mind openly as a citizen. I chose to step down from my job as a biotech CEO. I wrote Woke Inc., published it at the time when many people, most people in our movement didn't heard the word woke yet. And I was unleashed. I was free to speak my mind as a citizen. I still didn't care for partisan politics. I started donating to Republicans for a while, then I stopped that too. They disappointed me. Look at what happens election after election. 